speaking today about big problems with the Big Bang. This is a Big Bang is our standard cosmology we've had for more than a half century. And uh, we're going to investigate uh, some biblical issues with it, as well as some scientific issues. Now, before I get started, I probably ought to define what I mean by cosmology. It is the uh, study of the structure of the universe. It comes from two Greek words, cosmos meaning world, the big picture of the world at least, and logos literally meaning word, but we've kind of generalized that to refer to the study of things. Now, cosmology is not a modern concept. People have been talking about it at least since the ancient Greeks, and the Greeks had their own concept of cosmology. By the 3rd century or 4th century BC, the Greeks had come up with this model, and I, I brought a, um, a model of this with me today to share with you. The um, model they had was a, uh, the earth at the center. You can see in the middle there a little globe representing the earth. And then around it there is a crystalline sphere. And on that crystalline sphere you have little dots on there. They represent the, uh, the uh, stars. And we also have the uh, sun here or the moon, a little circle I can make move around like that. And every day either the entire globe, that celestial sphere, spun around the earth like this, or it stood still and the earth spun like that. Either one will get you the daily motion of the sun and the moon and the stars across the sky like that. And this model was considered a truth for 15 centuries, 20 centuries or so, certainly from the ancient Greeks right up until, um, well, about 400 years ago in Europe a change took place at that time. Now the Greeks had a name for this thing. By the way, the photo I have there I took at the lab uh, where I used to teach at USC Lancaster where we uh, used those quite a bit in our astronomy classes. And the uh, Greeks called this celestial sphere a stereoma. It meant something firm or something hard. And again, it was supposed to be crystalline made out of uh, say glass or some other hard uh, clear substance. Now, there have been many attempts throughout the ages to wed our understanding of Genesis, the cosmology of the Bible, with man's ideas about cosmology. See, I'm convinced that the cosmology of the Bible is not really clearly spelled out for us. There are certain things that are told. In fact, some of the things we are told are cosmogony. Cosmogony is similar to cosmology. It's the history and origin of the universe. And the Bible tells us quite a bit about that, but it doesn't tell us a lot of specifics about cosmology. And one of the things we encounter very early in the creation account is this uh, Hebrew word called rachia. It's something that God made on day two. It was translated uh, various ways. I'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, it was introduced on day two as a separator between waters above and waters below. And it says in verse eight of the day two account in Genesis one that God called this thing rachia that he made uh, heaven. Now, the uh, Septuagint, that's the LXX, refers to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, mostly in uh, Hebrew, but a little bit in, in Aramaic, into Greek, which had become the common language by the third century BC. And certainly many Jews at that point had picked up that language, and many of them weren't even speaking or reading Hebrew anymore. So they needed scriptures in their own language. So a group of uh, Scholars got together in Alexandria, Egypt. It was a center of culture and learning, and they translated the Old Testament into Greek. And they chose the word stereoma for this. And you have to ask the question, why did they translate it as stereoma? And I am convinced it's because they believed this model was correct. This was the cosmology that they were familiar with, and this is the cosmology that, uh, that they were teaching. And this thing, again, is a stereoma. It's something hard, and so consequently they, I believe, were, in, were putting their understanding of cosmology, not just what they thought about Scripture, but in Scripture itself, because this is what the translation read. And what they were doing there was they were reading into the Bible their understanding of cosmology. Now, a few centuries later, 600 years or so later, uh, the language has changed. Now, at least in the West, the uh, Greek had been replaced by Latin, and so Jerome translates the Bible, the entire Old and New Testament now, into Latin. It's called the, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Vulgate. And when he got to this word, he translated firmamentum. And if you look at the first four letters you can, of that, you get the word firm, and you understand why they call it the, the, uh, this thing, because, again, they were thinking this thing was 
hard. So I think even, even Jerome there is probably tipping his hand to the cosmology of his day because you see that Greek cosmology of this hard sphere was still very much believed in the West. Now we go forward a thousand years and at that point we get some early translations of, um, of the Bible, the Old Testament as well, into English. They get to this word and they translate it uh, firmamentum into firmament. They just create a new English word by transliterating that Latin word. Now, the problem is, this is not what the word rachia means. <laughs> Turns out many modern translations get this pretty good. It means expanse. It means expanse. It doesn't refer to anything hard at all. It refers to something that has been expanded. Now, this this translation that people went through for many, many years, over 2,000 years, really introduced some problems because it caused people to think about the rachia all wrong. In fact, when I was starting out as a young creation scientist in high school 50 years ago, I felt my calling was to be an astronomer for God's glory, and I thought, well, I need to understand the cosmology of the Bible. So I began reading very carefully for the first time, I believe, the first few chapters of Genesis, and very quickly I got to this word firmament, and I scratched my head, and I had no idea what that meant. I asked my father, who was a pastor of a small church, and he didn't quite know either, and none of the resources we had could really tell it what it was. I think things have gotten better. We have more resources now than we had back then. Now, this uh, problem we've had here, we're still living with the consequences, but we can trace it back 2,300 years back to when people were translating the Old Testament into Greek, and they chose a wrong word to translate it. Again, they meant well. They thought that they were helping out because they were, they were incorporating what they understood to be the proper cosmology. But, of course, we now have rejected that cosmology, and that always introduces the problem when you take the latest ideas of man and interpret Scripture in terms of that, which is exactly what happened here. Now, uh, how it continues going on, we have here a depiction, supposedly a medieval depiction of how the world worked. You have a flat earth, which, by the way, people in the, in the uh, Middle East and Middle, Middle Ages did not believe the earth was flat. That's a myth that was created in the 19th century. You then see that dome sitting there, and the stars and the sun and the moon are inside of that dome. And then you've got this intrepid explorer to the lower left there who's popped his head out and he's looking behind the firmament and his domed firmament over the earth, and he's seeing the inner workings of of, of uh, what's really going behind all of that. And this is sometimes called, many times, usually called, this, in, this uh, depiction is called the Flammarian engraving. And most people, it's considered to be a depiction of what people in the Middle Ages believed and in the ancient world believed. As it turns out, the Flammarian engra engraving is very old. It dates all the way back to 1888. Yeah, just 130 years ago. This is not a medieval depiction after all. Again, a lot of ideas were introduced about Scripture and cosmology of the Bible in the 19th century, which are wrong. Now, there was a second attempt to wed Genesis to the cosmology. Uh, around the early, early 2nd century AD, there was an astronomer named Claudius Ptolemy living in Alexandria, Egypt, again. It was a, again, as a, a center of learning and, and culture at that time, Greek thought. And he came up with what we call the Ptolemaic model. Now, it was geocentric in the sense that the earth was near the center, and this is a geocentric model right here. As I pointed out, the sun is at the center of this model, and that's the way most ancient Greeks thought about the world. In fact, that persisted well until about the uh, 400 years ago. Now, the thing is, the sun and the moon and the stars all seem to spin around the earth once a day, and so do the planets. There are five naked eye planets, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, they look like bright stars. In fact, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are in the morning sky right now, putting, been putting on a show for several months. They look like bright stars, but they move with respect to the background stars. I've been watching them the first few months of this year because they've been moving from west to east in the sky. But right now, they're starting, pretty soon, they're starting this reversal of motion. They're going backwards for a while, what we call retrograde motion. They'll do this for a few months on into the summer and autumn, and then they'll revert back to their normal west to east motion. That's very complicated motion and it defied explanation. Now what's going, in the ancient world it did, what's going on is that the earth is moving, they are moving, we're all orbiting around the, different, the sun at different rates on different orbits, and from time to time 
we pass up, the earth passes up Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They're farther away from the sun, moving more slowly, and we pass them up on an inside track. And as that happens, they seem to fall behind us and move backwards. It's an illusion. They're not really moving backwards. They just seem to be moving backwards. Imagine, imagine you're driving along on a, on, a, on a highway and you are overtaking or passing another car. Even though it's moving forward, as you pass that car, it seems to move backwards. By the way, when Mercury and Venus pass us up, we see the same sort of thing, that backward motion taking place. Well, Ptolemy is able to explain this by using what we call epicycles. Kind of complicated, kind of gearing kind of motion. Uh, what, he, what he did is he had each planet move on a small circle called an epicycle like this. And then he had the center of the epicycle move around the earth on a larger circle he called a deferent. Now by changing the sizes of these two circles, the epicycle and then the deferent, and altering the speed at which they turn, this motion and that motion, he could get a pretty good match to the, uh, to the data. So he's able to fit his model, epicyclic uh, model, to, epicyclic model, to the, uh, the actual observations. And here's a little illustration showing how that happens. The Earth is at the center there, that green circle, and then you got the little red circle representing the epicycle, let's say, of Mars. And you got a little red dot on that, and notice that the, the red dot is going along the red circle. That's the epicycle, again, of that planet. But then the epicycle is moving around the deferent, that large kind of greenish looking circle with a white dot on it. That white dot represents the center of that epicycle. Again, it's kind of complicated, isn't it? Now there's a blue line that runs from the Earth past the planet, in this case Mars, as I suggested. And it points to stars on the far right. You see five asterisks there representing stars. And as this thing moves along, that little loop-de-loop -loop on the far right there illustrates the apparent motion you would see. It goes forward, now it goes backwards, then it goes forward again. Let's watch that again. The planet's moving forward with respect to the stars, now it appears to move backwards, and then it goes forward again. Notice that always happens when that planet is passing on the near side of that epicycle closest to Earth. And again, Ptolemy was able to make that fit very well. And this was a tremendous leap uh, in ancient uh, science. And this made the dominant model for the next 15 centuries. It was kind of uh, folded into this other model of the uh, globe sitting around the Earth, a celestial sphere with, with uh, stars impregnated on it. Well, let's see what happened after that. It became the most successful theory in, in, in history of science, in terms of longevity it is, for 1,500 years it was thoroughly believed in the West and people didn't think it could be possibly wrong. Now its strength was that it could be continually modified. You see from time to time there were slight discrepancies. This thing is not really uh, giving us reality, it's an approximation, it's a model, it's good enough, but over the centuries slight discrepancies occurred between the actual motions of the planets and the predicted motions from the Ptolemaic model. So what was the fix? Well, you added a few more epicycles. You have the big epicycle like this, but you added a couple of more small ones on that. And as time went by, there were more needs for fixes, so more epicycles were thrown at it. Now, the original model had about a dozen epicycles, a couple for each of the planets and then uh, one or two for the sun and the moon. That's it. But then... As time went by, more and more were added until about 500 years ago, 400 years ago, systems required as many as 100 or more epicycles. You had epicycles upon epicycles upon epicycles. You see, it worked. You could always make it fit any new challenge, any new problem. You could always make it fit by adding additional epicycles. That was its strength. But it had a weakness. You know what it was? The weakness was that it could be continually modified. You see, as you added more and more epicycles, the Ptolemaic model became more and more complicated. And it led to a, a dilemma here. It, it meant that the model could not be disproved. You see, any kind of theory or model we have in science must at least hypothetically have the possibility of being disproved. You can conduct an experiment or conduct an observation and then have predictions based upon your model or on your theory. And if, if, your theory, if your predictions contradict your observations or experiments, then you've just disproved the theory. But if your theory or model cannot be disproved because you're allowed to continually change it, 
then it cannot be disproved. And there's a principle many people pursue in science that says any model that cannot be disproved is really not a model at all. We're not talking about science anymore. Furthermore, the problem became very complex. There was this thing called Occam's razor that says if confronted with two different hypotheses, one with very few assumptions and one with many assumptions, very complicated, the simpler one with the fewest assumptions probably is the correct one. And uh, by uh, 400 years ago, there were a number of people who were calling this into question. One of them is a man named Galileo Galilei. You may have heard about him. Uh, a lot of what you've heard about him or learned about him probably isn't true. I could do a whole talk just on the Galileo affair, but we don't have time to talk about that today. Suffice it to say, what happened was uh, he stood up for the heliocentric model, the idea that the Earth is one of several planets orbiting around the sun in which those large epicycles are no longer needed. And it's a much simpler approach. And from that, we've uh, got Kepler and Newton and other people coming into play. And we now have a fantastic model. I've had it for centuries that explains all these motions very precisely with no adjustments necessary. It's a much better model than what we had before. Unfortunately, this, is, this has been portrayed as a conflict between science and religion, and we're still living with this, the results of that ever since. Keep in mind the problems with the Ptolemaic model. I'll come back to that a little later. So now we come, by the way, both these events, the first and the second, have led to very bad consequences, disastrous consequences, I do believe. So now we have this third attempt, I think, going on today to read our cosmology, or in this case, cosmogony, into Scripture. And why should it be any different than what it was back then? Whenever you man, read man, man's ideas into Scripture, it leads to problems. Well, the Big Bang model became the, common, uh, the dominant cosmogony, or cosmology, a lot of people say today, after 1965. Uh, what happened in 1965? I'll share that in just a minute. And as a result, in the wake of this, many Christians began to say, well, we see that the universe had a beginning. You see, up to this point, Greek thought and Western thought had, had hypothesized that the universe had no beginning. It's always existed. And they said, aha, for the first time in history, we now know, we have scientific proof that the universe had a beginning. So it must have a beginner. It must have a creator. So let me introduce you to that creator. Once I've proved to you scientifically there had to be a beginning. So many uh, cre cre Christians today think they see within Scripture the Big Bang. Again, we're repeating the same mistake that's been made before. And they view this as being a very evangelistic tool. After all, if you can convince people there must be a God because science says so, then uh, it's very easy then to turn to the New Testament and introduce you to that creator. But I have two questions. Is this Big Bang cosmogony even true? And is it biblical? If the answer to either one of those questions is no, then we have a very bad approach going on here, approach to Scripture and approach to evangelism. I would submit that both of these answers are no, so this is doubly a bad idea. Now, I have a photograph here of a, of a man. Anybody recognize who that is? Anybody? Ah, somebody said it over here. It, you're right, it's Edwin Hubble. Very famous man. He was one of the most famous astronomers in the first half of the 20th century. And he had several great contributions to modern astronomy. One was that he proved that other galaxies exist. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. It's a collection of a few hundred billion stars orbiting around a common center of mass. And at the time of Hubble, 100 years ago, people mostly, most astronomers thought the, the Milky Way was the only thing that existed. That was the universe. But then in 1924, he demonstrated that there were many other galaxies, or if you will, at the time they said other universes out there. The nearest galaxy of any size comparable to our own is the Andromeda galaxy, and it's a couple of million light years away. Pretty far compared to the size of the Milky Way, a little more than 100,000 light years away. And many other galaxies are much, much farther away. But then in 1929, he's credited with proving that the universe is expanding. Well, how did he do this? Well, he used what was then the largest telescope in the world, a 100-inch hooker telescope on Mount Wilson above Los Angeles. And uh, he photographed and took the spectra of many different galaxies. Here's one galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. I've mentioned it before. It's about a couple of million light years away. Then we have the Sombrero galaxy, or M104. It's uh, even farther away. Uh, 
few, probably 30 to 50 million light years, I'm going to guess. And then we have a more distant galaxy. I'm not sure how far away this galaxy is. I have to look up which one it is and how far away it is. But um, he started looking at the spectrum, and every time he looked at the spectrum, most galaxies, they have a red shift. That means that their spectral lines, their spectral features, are shifted towards longer wavelengths, towards the red end of the spectrum. It suggests that these galaxies are getting farther and farther away from us. Now, he also measured the distances, and he found out that there was a relationship between distances of galaxies and the red shifts. And I'll, I'll have here a reproduction out of his original 1929 paper. This is a 91-year-old publication now. And if you look very carefully on that, you'll see that velocity in kilometers per second, or red shift, is vertically plotted. And horizontally, you have the uh, distance. Now, his measurements of distance were kind of crude back then. We've done much better then and extended it out a huge range. But you'll notice those little points and dots go generally from lower left to upper right. We would say mathematically there's a linear relationship between redshift and distance. Now, already people had suggested the possibility the universe might be expanding, it might be contracting. And so what Hubble did is he said, look, I've got data that can show that it's expanding, it's getting larger, meaning galaxies are getting farther and farther apart. Now, this is an interpretation of the data. The data simply relate redshift and distance. It's an interpretation to say that that redshift implies that these things are actually getting farther away from us. By the way, an interpretation I have no trouble with, no problem with, but it is an interpretation. Now, this next person's a little difficult to, uh, uh, to identify for a little many people. They're going to be thrown because of his clerical collar because, as you may guess, he was a Roman Catholic priest. Anybody know who this is? Well, it's not, common, not uncommon for nobody in the audience to know. And I'll just give it away to His name was George Lemaitre. He was indeed a Belgian priest, but he was also a theoretical physicist. He had a PhD in theoretical physics. Many people are surprised to learn that some priests, there are actually some astronomers who are priests. Uh, there are many Catholic universities, and many of them are employed as faculty members at those places. The Vatican even has an observatory, believe it or not. Uh, by the way, their telescope is not called Lucifer. We've got an article on our website. If you've heard that, that rumor, please check it out on our website. They have no telescope by that name. Please stop spreading that rumor if you're doing that. Well, he came up with this idea of call, he called the primeval atom or cosmic egg. He said, just about the time Hubble produ uh, produced his paper, uh, Lemaitre said, I think that since the universe is expanding, if you go back into time, the galaxies would, and all the matter in the universe would have been closer and closer and closer together. So there would have been a time in the past when all the matter was inside of this little tiny uh, hot dense uh, form and it began expanding outward from there. If you are the least bit familiar with the Big Bang model, you will understand that's very similar, kind of a naive way of looking at it, but it's considered the precursor. The actual Big Bang model uh, in its modern form was published uh, a couple of decades later, around 1948. And the belief is, the Big Bang is this, that the universe began in a very hot, very dense state, and the universe popped into existence, uh, both matter and energy, but also space and time, popped into existence, expanding, and it's been expanding, and as any expanding gas will do, it will cool, and it's cooled tremendously from, uh, you know, very high temperatures, millions of Kelvin perhaps, down to only 3 Kelvin over about 13.8 billion years is the current estimate. Now, this idea met a lot of early rejection. For the first uh, few decades, not many people liked it because, number one, it had a beginning to the universe. And that is, was anathema to people because they believed the universe was eternal. Number two, then, if, if the universe had a beginning, that suggested a creator possibility to some people, and many people didn't want to go there. Now, this all changed when I was coming down the pike in the mid-60s. In 1965, there was a publication of what's called the CMB for short. It stands for Cosmic Microwave Background. And it uh, comes from the uh, Big Bang model that the universe was once very hot and very dense, but it's expanded since then. When you had a very hot, dense plasma of gas there, it would have been producing a very hot spectrum. But that spectrum has since expanded and cooled by a thousand fold. So now it's going to be very cool around three Kelvin temperature. And this would be over in the microwave part of the spectrum coming from every direction in space. 
Now, the steady state model or other eternal universe models could not predict that because, couldn't explain that because their universe was never filled with radiation like that. Well, in 1965, two astronomers to, uh, to working for Bell Labs, as it turns out, or were studying uh, the background radiation. They found, discovered this background radiation in the course of their study, and it's been called the uh, CMB ever since. A dozen years later, they shared the Nobel Prize in physics for this discovery because this is the one evidence that supposedly proved the Big Bang happened. And here I have a spectrum across of this. The brightness is vertical, and the frequency is horizontally. And uh, it's a logarithmic scale on both axes, which makes it a little difficult for some people to interpret. But you'll notice that at, at shorter way of frequencies, uh, lower frequencies on the far left, it's kind of low. It rises to a peak and then it drops off very rapidly at the far right at higher frequencies. And this is what we call a black body curve, exactly the kind of curve you would expect from um, a very hot plasma, now cooled, of course. And those little various points on there from different experiments have been connected with a little dotted line that represents a 2.726 Kelvin black body. And the fit is very, very good. This one observation back in 1965 um, was, again, the big proof. And within a couple of years, almost everybody had, had jumped ship and embraced the, uh, the Big Bang, and it's been the only game in town for the past half centuries. Now, there have been some problems over the years with the cosmic microwave background. We've studied it extensively. The first satellite to do so at great length was the COBE experiment, the Cosmic Background Explorer, launched in 1989. It had a two-year mission to explore, map out the entire microwave spectrum all in every direction around us. And they were looking for small temperature fluctuations. Remember the temperature is less than three Kelvin, but they were expecting that there would be fluctuations in temperature from one point to another nearby to one part in 10,000. Isn't that amazing? You're gonna measure something to three ten thousandths of a Kelvin. That is incredible. We have the technology to do that sort of thing today and better now than we had back just 30 years ago. Now, they uh, had predicted in the 1970s what kind of fluctuations you would expect. Those fluctuations are necessary to produce structure in the universe. You see, the Big Bang is really smooth to start with, but you need slight variations in density to act as gravitational seeds. If some areas are a little more dense than others, they will attract more matter to them than to other regions, hence accentuating those differences in density, making places rarer and making other places more dense. This would lead to structures such as galaxies, stars, planets, and people. Without this taking place, simply put, we wouldn't be here to observe the universe. But you can have too much of a good thing. The idea was if you had too many gravitational seeds, too clumpy, then everything gets sucked up into supermassive black holes and you don't get galaxies, stars, planets, people. We're not here to look at the universe. So it's a very careful balance. They did their best uh, guess based on their model of what it ought to look like. So this thing was designed, COBE was designed specifically to look for the predicted fluctuations. And when they did the experiment, they discovered they, they would look perfectly smooth. Only after background radiation did, only after they did powerful statistical techniques on it did they find slight variations, but they were an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 less. Instead of being one part in 10,000, they were part one part in 100,000. Yet, since then, many people have told me, I've read this, been told this, that the predictions beautifully match the observations. I said, what? Excuse me? <laughs> That's not what happened. Well, they fixed it. How did they fix it? Well, what they did is they, once they knew what the fluctuations were, they went, then went back down and they played with the model and altered the model to make it fit the data. And keep in mind that the model had predicted the fluctuations they expected. They then looked for the fluctuations. At first, they couldn't find them. They did find them a factor of 10 lower than that. And then some people have the nerve to tell me with a straight face that the predictions match the models. Well, no, they, they didn't. It was predicted after the fact, all right? Be like if I give you a quiz at the end of my presentation today. Okay, I said if. Don't get excited. We won't really have a test. But suppose I wanted to test you on how well you paid attention today. I can see some of you are very fearful. You didn't know it was going to be a test today, right? Again, we're just playing hypothetical. But... Uh, let me tell you that the 
I, I, will, I will tell you the answer to the one question I'm going to put on the test. You all ready? The answer is 42. <laughs> yeah, some of you get that one, don't you? All right, 42 is the answer to the question. Now, if when I ask the question at the end of the class today, or the end of the presentation, not a class, presentation today, how many of you will get that answer correct? I'm always concerned when I ask this, and not every hand is up. A few of you are out raising your hands. What's the matter? Are you dumb as a sack of rocks? Do not believe me? Did you hear me not say 42? Of course you're going to pass the test, aren't you? Unless you're not paying attention at all. But would that really be a good test of how well you grasp the material today? And the answer is no, because I just gave you the answer. You're doing the same thing here. We're giving the answer to the model, and the model is then, after the fact, predicting what the result ought to be. And that's no way to do science. That's not the way science works. Now, here's a map of the cosmic microwave background sampled over the entire sky that we replaced with better maps, and I'll show you a better map a little later. Sometimes people are a little puzzled by this, and uh, I should explain this. Imagine you have a sphere, like the outside of a sphere, like the Earth's globe like this. Have you ever seen a globe done this way? Well, the equator would run across the middle there horizontally, wouldn't it? And the north and south pole would be at the top and the bottom. There's going to be some distortions because you're trying to project the globe onto a flat plane, but that oval, that ellipse you're seeing there does a decent job. You've probably seen maps done that way, haven't you? Well, imagine instead of looking down onto the earth, we look up into the sky, and it's going to be this big celestial sphere. What we see in this image here, then, is an image of the entire sky, spherical that it may be, shown there. And so there's kind of an equator running across the middle. That equator, by the way, is the galaxy's equator and the galactic north and south poles are top and bottom. So that's what you're seeing there. And there's little... Uh, Blue and yellow and red and green, those are different temperature variations that are present in the cosmic microwave background. The hotter regions are red, then yellow, then green is in between, and the blue are little cooler areas. The darker blue, the coolest regions of all the red regions, are the warmer regions. By the way, I will draw your attention to a feature right here. If you look over to the right, there's a region right here that looks kind of long, and it's like a ridge of higher than average temperature right there. A ridge of higher than average temperature. That's called the axis of evil. I'll talk more about that a little later on. And then if you look off to the lower right, there's an area right here, very dark blue. That's called the, uh, the cold spot on, the, on this. And I will talk again more about that later. Now, there are some problems for the... Uh, for the Big Bang model. And I seem to be hung up. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay, there's some problems for the, uh, the Big Bang model. One's called the horizon problem. And that's the fact that the cosmic microwave background has the same temperature in every direction. If I look off in this direction, I'm supposedly seeing radiation coming over a distance of 13.8 billion light years. It's been traveling for 13.8 billion years. I'll call that point A. And the light is just, the radiation, the microwave, microwave radiation from that is just now reaching my location here on the Earth, point E, I'll call it point A to point E. Now, if I look in this diametrically opposite direction, I'll call that point B. I'm also seeing photons of light coming in the microwave part of the spectrum that have been traveling for 13.8 billion years. They have just reached my location here at point A, E. Question, if the light from point A is just now getting to my location, has it ever gotten to point B? Or has light from point B ever gotten to point A? And the obvious answer is no, it couldn't have. So why do these have the same temperature? They're very precisely, one part in 100,000 typically, the same temperature, but yet why are they like that? They've never been in contact with each other. We say thermal contact so they can exchange heat and come to the same temperature. This is a principle of what we, from thermodynamics. In order to bring things to the same temperature, they must come in thermal contact. So it's a big mystery why these two points have the same temperature. And by the way, we can generalize this to any direction in space you want to go. Diametrically opposite, they all have the same direction. It's called a horizon problem because the light from over there can't see to the other side. And this is a huge problem. 
Uh, so disparate parts of the universe have the same temperature even though they've never been in thermal contact. Then we have what's called the flatness problem, and it can be approached several ways, referring to the geometry of the universe as one way. The way I prefer to do it is to look at a ratio of a number called omega. This is one of the five uh, parameters, basic parameters of modern cosmology. And it's, I can view, define it as a great ratio between gravitational and potential, potential energy and kinetic energy. Those are two forms of energy we deal with in physics all the time. Now, the thing is, if this universe begins with a value of omega less than one, it can be anywhere between zero and infinity, basically. It, it, it has to be a positive number, the way it's defined. Then if it's, any, if it's anything less than one, it will, with expansion of the universe over billions of years, the value of omega will go towards zero. Okay? Now, if it's greater than one, it will increase to ever larger values. One is the break-even number. So after billions of years of expansion, the value of omega should be nowhere near one. It should be either very, very close to zero, like, you know, to like 100 decimal points or something, or it should be this huge number. Well, we've tested it and measured repeatedly over the past century, and the value of omega appears to be very close to one. In fact, it may be identically close to one. How could that possibly be? That makes no sense that the universe randomly generates in such a way that its value of omega is so close to one after all these billions of years. Well, this was caused quite a bit of consternation through the 70s and into the 80s, and so they came up with a solution back then in the 1980s called cosmic inflation. Now, what happens here, they say when the universe is very small, very young, and we're talking like 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the universe popped into existence, you ever wonder how long 10 to the minus 34 seconds is? Well, it's a decimal point followed by, what, 33 zeros and a one. Yeah, it's a pretty short time interval. That long after the Big Bang happened, the universe is still very, very tiny, but expanding rapidly. It suddenly went through a hyper-expansion far, far, far faster than the speed of light. The universe starts to just suddenly, boom, expands very rapidly. And then, about 10 to the minus 32 seconds, almost after it started, the universe goes back, stops hyperinflating. inflation ends, it goes back to normal expansion. So this expansion was far, far faster than light, which is allowed, by the way, in general relativity. Now what this does is it forces the value of omega, no matter what it was to start with, to be almost identically equal to one, like one to 150 or 300 decimal places or something, of which it's only recently and gradually backed away a tiny little bit. The other thing that it does is it allows the universe to come in thermal contact with itself before that inflation, then it's ripped out of thermal contact and which only gradually the universe is starting to reestablish that thermal contact. And it's kind of, in one fell swoop, kind of explains both of these problems. Great idea. It seems to be work, doesn't it? In fact, every cosmologist today seems to be convinced that that is exactly what happened in the very early universe. However, I note that there is no evidence for this. Now, that's the way science is supposed to work. You come up with a proposal for something, a hypothesis in this case, and then you, you then make predictions and try to test those predictions. Now, if it cannot be tested, if you cannot come up with a test for it, either yes or no, uh, potential of disproving it again, then it really isn't science at all. It might be science fiction, it might be philosophy, it might be religion, but it's not science. So this is a non-scientific concept. It's ad hoc in the sense we just... We just did this. Uh, we just made it up at this point. I often tell people that ad hoc is Latin for we're just making this up as we go along. And it's, again, as I said, it's not falsifiable, which is the way that science is supposed to work. But there are even more problems for this. For instance, there's a lack of magnetic monopoles. Now, what's a magnetic monopole? Well, you know that a magnet has a north and a south pole on it, and with classical physics, uh, you can't have just one pole by itself. If you cut that magnet in half, you'll magically get a north and a south that forms on either end, and you'll still have a, now two magnets with north and south. You can't isolate and have a single magnetic north or a single magnetic south. If you had such things, it would be called monopoles. Well, it turns out in the Big Bang cosmology, cosmogony, there should be a few magnetic monopoles in the universe. We're not making this up so much. It's just what the theory says. 
And there have been a number of experiments going on for decades looking for them. They've never found one. Ah, cosmic inflation, that solves it too. It makes the density of magnetic monopoles very small, so we'd, we wouldn't expect to find any locally. Well, again, there's no evidence for this. And this is a big one. I didn't talk about this for many years because I thought the problem was solved. In fact, many, many cosmologists and physicists thought it was, but lo and behold, it wasn't. There's an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Oh, you've heard of antimatter, right? Yeah, in science fiction stories. Turns out it's not science fiction. Antimatter was, pre was predicted nearly 100 years ago and was soon found. It comes right out of the theory of particle physics, quantum mechanics, and it's real. And when, a, say, a proton meets up with its antiproton, poof, they annihilate in this b blinding release of energy, and they're both gone. Now, we don't see this taking place in the universe today. It appears that the universe is dominated by matter. That is, there may be a little bit of antimatter, but it doesn't last long because there's so much matter in the universe. So antimatter doesn't really exist. But the Big Bang model demands that there be a, a complete symmetry between the two. There should be as much antimatter as there is matter. This clearly is not what the universe looks like. And at this point, the one the solution they had for this was... Uh, was actually disproved a few years ago. And this is one of those things they don't talk about much, but that's a huge problem for the Big Bang. Why is there an asymmetry there? It should not exist, yet the universe is very asymmetrical with regards to matter and antimatter. I mentioned the axis of evil before. This, uh, this is a cool ridge in this cosmic microwave background. It extends for about 60 degrees. That's like one-sixth of the way around the sky. And get this. It seems to be aligned with the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. We call that the ecliptic. Now, if this is truly cosmic microwave background, has nothing to do with the Earth, why is it lined up with our orbit around the sun? That makes no sense. It could be coincidence, but there, again, there's still no explanation for that axis of evil within the Big Bang model. And the, the cold spot, again, there is no explanation uh, for that either. These features should not be there. There are huge asymmetries in the microwave background, and yet it would violate the very principles on which the Big, Big Bang model are founded, uh, is founded. So again, here's another map of the cosmic microwave background. And off to the right, I'm going to risk turning on this thing and locking the computer up for a moment here. But off to the, uh, to the lower right there, there's this long ridge of brighter than average temperatures, those yellow and kind of uh, tan spots. Those, that's the, uh, that is the axis of evil. And down here is that uh, big cold spot down at the bottom. And both of those are severe problems for the Big Bang model. Over the years, I've seen changes in the Big Bang model. Uh, since I've been in graduate school, the expansion rate changed. That was about 30 years ago. The expansion rate also changed the age of the universe. When they, uh, when they increased the expansion rate, the, they decreased the age. Back for many, many years, they said the universe, from about 1960 to about uh, early 1990s, they said the Big Bang was 16 to 18 billion years ago. Now they say it's 13.8 billion years, uh, years ago, plus or minus 1%. If you look very carefully at that, you understand that those two do not overlap at all. So they both cannot be right. They both could be wrong, but they both cannot be right. Now, uh, dark matter has been introduced. And I have a talk presentation I give on dark matter. I happen to think that dark matter exists. I think there's a very good case to be made from this, purely from observational science, nothing to do with cosmology or Big Bang. Now, dark matter is the understanding that 90% of so of the mass of the universe, the matter in the universe, is totally invisible. Well, you know, for many years, we had this Big Bang model that didn't include dark matter. And then uh, in the 19, by the 1980s, astronomers became to realize, hey, you know, we're missing out most of the matter of the universe. About, it's like an iceberg. Most of it's below the surface. We can't see it. Only a tiny 10% of it's there. It took the, the cosmologists about another decade to, to incorporate the uh, dark matter into their models. Now consider this. The dominant force in the universe in cosmology is, the, uh, uh, is gravity. But if you've left out... 90% of the matter of the universe, the mass of the universe, then you've left out 90% of the gravity. Your model couldn't possibly be correct, could it? 
That's the reason why they had to add that eventually. The cosmological constant was introduced by Albert Einstein almost uh, over a century ago. This is an idea that uh, as the force of, of space has for itself, it kind of repels itself. And he was kind of forced in a way to embrace that. But, you know, it was uh, rejected pretty quickly. He said it later on it was one of the biggest blunders ever made. Well, interestingly enough, two decades ago, in the late 1990s, dark matter came back, except, I'm assuming a uh, a uh, cosmological constant came back, except now they don't call it that. They call it dark energy. It's a time-varying thing rather than a constant thing. So a lot of changes have been made. Uh, over the past 30 years, I've seen the expansion rate has changed, the age has changed. No inflation was considered. There was no dark matter considered. No dark energy I just uh, alluded to here. Uh, no string theory. Uh, that's something I haven't talked about, but that wasn't included much 30 years ago. Yet 30 years ago or so, they had complete confidence in the theory. They knew it was correct. There was no, no getting around it. The universe was 16 to 18 billion years old, except now they say it's quite a bit younger than that, and they've changed the model all along. Now, what will the, uni what will the Big Bang model look like in another 30 years? Well, I don't know, but I'm confident of two things. It will be very different than today's model, and they will have complete confidence in that model as well. Notice what's gone on. As problems develop, as difficulties arise, they just simply change the model to fit the new problems and solve those problems away. Isn't that beginning to look a lot like epicycles? Remember, what caused the demise of the Ptolemaic model was all these epicycles they kept adding. That was the weakness and the strength of the model. You could change it indefinitely. I think the Big Bang has gotten into that ground as well. And when it does that, it's no longer science. It become dogma, man's dogma. Well, how does that compare to Scripture? Well, Scripture does not change. Our understanding may change, but Scripture does not change. How about the origin of the universe? Some, some uh, people see God in this. Many Christians see in this the handprint of God, the fingerprint of God. Other people say, no, it's just a quantum fluctuation. And this is the idea that you can have small violations of uh, conservation of inner energy and mass over a very short length of time. It's pretty sketchy science, actually. I'm not the only person who criticizes this interpretation. And it rests upon the idea that the universe has zero energy. Well, I look around in the universe and I see a lot of non-zero energy. I see a lot of positive energy in the universe. And so in order for this to work at all, they have to argue that the, uh, there's a lot of negative energy out there that somehow balances the books. This is an assumption uh, there's not been proved that this is actually the case. They just must have this, otherwise they have a problem with their model because at the very least they need a God to intervene to make this happen, if this can happen at all. There are two very famous quotes I love here uh, referring to this, this very random uh, accidental origin of the universe. You see, this, this makes the Big Bang the ultimate uh, accident, the ultimate evolutionary explanation for things. But uh, one quote is this, the universe is the ultimate free lunch. The universe came from nothing. You hear that you know, nothing's free, even a free lunch. Somebody's paying for it. It's costing something. Well, this is the ultimate free lunch. That you can, you, you're getting your, your, your lunch totally free in this particular case. I love this and even better. The universe is just one of those things that happens from time to time. <laughs> I love that. That's the ultimate appeal to randomness in the world. But see, the world doesn't even exist. Suddenly it does. That's the kind of random event we're talking about about. Well, is the Big Bang biblical? Well, remember, it's an event that happened 13.8 billion years ago, but that's not the way Scripture records it. It says in Exodus 20, 11, that God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them in six days, six normal days. This is in the context of the giving the Ten Commandments, this one being keeping the Sabbath. If these are not six normal days, then how can God have expected the the Jews or Hebrews there at, at uh, Sinai to observe six normal literal days. Also in the Big Bang, star, many, many stars preceded the earth. You know, the, uh, the earth is supposedly four and a half billion years old, but the first stars appeared within a half billion years after the Big Bang, nine billion years or so before there ever was an earth. The earth is a Johnny come lately. But scripture tells us in the day four account that God made the earth first and then the stars a few days later. Furthermore, the, uh, like any evolutionary process, the Big Bang unfolded over a long period of time and in many respects is still going on today. But the beginning of chapter 2 of Genesis tells us that 
the creation is finished and on the sixth, seventh day God rested. Where do you place the time in all of this? Billions of years as opposed to only thousands of years. Well, we have the day age theory, the allegory theory, all sorts of other things to try to explain this. I think I've seen every one of them. I am intellectually open to, uh, to the possibility of somehow getting billions of years in, in, the, in the scriptural account. Again, I think I've seen them all, but if you think you have one I've never seen, please come up afterwards. We'll talk about it. I've probably seen it, though. Okay, the, um, the direction of the Big Bang uh, research is very atheistic. If this thing is so clearly taught in Scripture, as some people would want to claim, then why were there not Christians in the forefront of this leading the charge on the Big Bang cosmology? There were not any. In fact, today I don't know of a single Christian among the heavy hitters in cosmology circles today. I don't even know of any theists. Many of them are atheists. It seems to me to be the ultimate atheistic theory, and Christians are kind of coming into, the, into this whole process pretty late rather than pretty early on all of this. The time issue I've already alluded to. Where do you put the time? The order of creation I've alluded to. The order of creation is all wrong, as it is with any evolutionary model, different from what the biblical text of Genesis 1 tells us. And you know what? The beginning of the universe is, is uh, I believe, was sudden and rapid, very quick, just as the end is going to be, 1 Peter 3.10 speaks of a new heaven and a new earth as well as Isaiah and Revelation. And I believe everybody would agree uh, that those are rapid things. So why was not the beginning? They're like bookends upon all of this. And ultimately, when the Big Bang is abandoned, what will become of our apologetic? Our Big Bang apologetic would drag Scripture down with it because I'm saying uh, when, I'm not saying if, because you see, every scientific theory has its shelf life. The Ptolemaic model lasted for 15 centuries. Great model, but ultimately was cast aside. I am convinced the Big Bang model one day will be cast aside as well. When that happens, if you have erected your foundation of biblical interpretation upon it, then it discredits Scripture as it does that. It's a changing model. Man's ideas are always changing, but Bible is not. It's contrary to Scripture. We should base upon everything we believe upon Scripture, not the other way around. And again, when it's discarded, what be happens to our apologetic? If you want to know more, I have written on some things on this. We have a book, Universe by Design, a little dated. It came out uh, over 15 years ago, but still uh, very much up to speed. And it's uh, more technical than most, some of the other writings we have. I've also written a couple other books uh, more recently. One, The Creative Cosmos, which is a discussion of uh, biblical creation, uh, everything about what the Bible says about astronomy, particularly in all of this. The companion book to that I wrote a year afterwards, It's Expansive Heaven, is uh, a book about uh, the creation science of, uh, of the uh, of the. Uh, uh, of the creation science of astronomy we find in Scripture. Well, I thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate you uh, being here. Hope for, hope, look forward to seeing you once again.